Be sure to download the note card you'll find in the video description, a link to the note card, and follow along with the lesson, fill it in. It'll be a record for you of what you have learned in this lesson from the Bible. And I'll, by all means, get your Bible. Go get your Bible. How many of you have a Bible? I always ask that question. I always like to see the Bible. So get your Bible. Follow along. And if you like this sermon, ring the bell. Also, uh, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Ring the bell to get a notification of when new content is added. If you want to follow us on social media, links to our social media account are in the video description. So now, let's jump into the sermon. One of the most shocking statements in the Bible to me is Paul's statement in Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 6, where he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. My initial response to such a statement is to question it as an overstatement. <clears throat> I want to soften it a little and say that it, I just need to be careful regarding what I'm anxious about. If I heard this statement in a vacuum, not knowing who said it or why, I would immediately assume it was some young, naive preacher making grandioso statements that simply are unsupportable. But the problem with that is I know who said it. It was the Apostle Paul who at the time was neither young nor naive. He said it by inspiration, which means it is certainly supportable. What really causes me to stand up and take more notice is the number of things about which this man had to be stressed out and anxious about. Just consider the things mentioned in this letter alone. For example, in Philippians 1 and verse 7, he said, It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment, watch that, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Verse 15 and 16, There were men teaching from envy and strife just to add afflictions to his chains. Verse 20, <clears throat> He knew he was about to be executed, and he said, It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. In verse 28 through 30, he knew his friends were going to suffer. He says pretty much in verse 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1, and also in verse 14, evidently the church at Philippi was struggling with disunity and division. Look at what he says. He said, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection, any sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Verse 2 and 3, he says there, I entreat Eudoa and I entreat Sinche to agree with the Lord. Yes, I ask also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Chapter 2 and verse 25. Though Epaphroditus was well by this writing, Paul had friends who were dying. At this, when he wrote this, he was, he said, Epaphroditus ministered to his needs. He helped him. And indeed, he was ill near to death at the time Paul wrote this. 
Uh, chapter 3, verse 2, false teachers were getting uh, to the brethren. Uh, verse 7, he said, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He had to give up everything that had meaning to him when he became a Christian. Verse 17 and 18 of chapter 3, he knew of brethren in Philippi who needed to be disciplined by the congregation. He said, many whom I have told you and now tell you even with tears as enemies of the cross of Christ needed to be disciplined, we find there. In verse 10 of chapter 4, he said, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Listen to that. This is the man who said, be anxious for nothing. Then this man explained how to avoid anxiety. When I consider what Paul had been through, that makes me want to sit up and read a little more closely within Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. That's our text today. Turn your Bible there, if you will, as we look today at Paul's three-point plan to have personal peace. What anxieties, distresses, frustrations, concerns plague us today that Paul did not go through before us? Take a look at Paul's plan for peace and take courage that we can indeed overcome the stresses of our personal lives, family lives, work lives, and even church lives. The first step in his plan, Paul says, is prayer. Prayer and trust God. Look at what he says in verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer... And supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. On the surface, we could easily just say that Paul's advice is to pray. We could talk about how to make requests and offer thanks, but that is really just the surface. The deeper issue that Paul is really bringing out is to trust God. No matter what stresses are weighing you down, trust that God is there and will take care of you. When you consider this trust, note four areas in which you must trust God. First, trust God that he will not abandon you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, he says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, watch what God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Additionally, Trust that nothing is so powerful as to overcome God such that we will be abandoned by him. Notice, if you will, Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He asked that question. Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, not any, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Trust God that he knows what we need. Even before we ask, look, if you will, at Matthew chapter six 
and in verse 8, he says, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. And then verse 32, he says, The Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Then number four, trust God that he cares about our needs and concerns. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, he said, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. And watch verse 7, underscore this, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Trust God. And then number five, trust God that he is able to care, of, uh, take care of us. And God demonstrates that in Hebrews chapter four and in verse six, where he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God has already demonstrated his ability to take care of us. That's why we owe him our thanks already. He demonstrates that the peace we will receive from God comes through Jesus Christ. What a welcome reminder. In fact, the one thing that should cause us the most anxiety and stress has already been dealt with in Christ. No wonder we can have peace. That one thing, of course, is sin. Do you want stress and anxiety? Then... Notice Philippians 4, verse 7, he said, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, your mind in Christ Jesus. If you want to overcome stress and anxiety, if you want to do that, then think about trying to get rid of your sins and keep from going to hell by yourself. That's the way you do it if you want the stress because you're not going to be able to do it. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 9, notice he says, Who can say I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. Now think about it. trying to get rid of your sins and keeping from going to hell by yourself. No matter what you do, you run into a brick wall. But you see, Jesus has taken care of that. We can overcome anxiety, stress, and frustration because the greatest stress is resolved. Do you remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through 11? He said, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, watch this. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul made a great statement. If God loved us so much to save us through Christ while we were still in our sins, how much more will God stay with us and get us to heaven once we have become his children in Christ? We can trust God to take care of us and provide what is best and most needed for us. So when we face anxieties and stresses, pray. Make your request known to God, giving thanks. And know that even when in your distress and anxiety, you do not know exactly how or what to pray, the Spirit knows how to and intercedes for us. Romans chapter 8 and in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's what he says there. And then secondly, think good thoughts. Paul gives a list of things upon which we should meditate. Watch what he says here 
in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, finally, brothers, he says here, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, this list, he says, think on these things. Basically, Paul said to think about good things. However, his statement is even stronger than that. The term meditate is logzama, and is defined by Sparosite's, the complete word study of the dictionary of the New Testament. Here's how he defines it. He says, to put together with one's mind, to count, to occupy oneself with reckonings or calculatings when it comes to this list. Here's a man in prison telling us in very strong terms to look on the bright side. Do not get bogged down in thinking about all the bad things. Do not count up in your mind all the false, irreverent, unfair, sinful, disgusting, terrible things that are happening to or around you. Count the good things. A song we sing, an old song, Count Your Many Blessing fits here. And it may surprise you what the Lord has already done. Look at Paul's example in the first chapter of Philippians alone. Notice Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. He said, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me is really served to advance the gospel. That's what he says here. <clears throat> Paul was in prison, but thought about how his imprisonment furthered the gospel. In verse 14, he thought about how his chains made the brethren bolder. He said, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Verse 15. In verse 15, he thought about how the dishonest teachers were still teaching the gospel and some might be saved, where he said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. He says, verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? only that in every way, whether I pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. That's what he says there. In chapter 1 and verse 21, he says there, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Look at the positive thoughts Paul is thinking when he could do that, and think negative thoughts in the circumstance that he was in. We talk a lot about the battle of the minds. One of the greatest battles of our times is the battle of the mind. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take, watch this, take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. We must wage war, that warfare. Bring our thoughts into captivity. Now, Martin Luther not, not to be confused with Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther from the Reformation time period once said, we may be able to stop the birds from flying over our heads, but we can, we can keep them from nesting in our hair. In like manner, we may never stop fleeing thoughts from coursing through our mind, but we can control our meditation. Meditate on the good things. And then finally, number three, not that the sermon's over, but number three point, no matter how you feel, do what you know is right. Now, this is as Firestone used to say, where the rubber meets the road, not at Firestone, but with doing what's right, no matter how you feel. 
there comes a point when we get up off our knees, get out of our thinking chairs. There comes a point when we have to decide to do something. Paul says, do what we know is right. Specifically to the Philippians, he said that they should do what he taught them. They should do what they saw him do. Certainly, Paul has not literally been with us. He has not preached sermons to us, nor have we seen his daily behavior. However, we do have a guide given to us. Paul was one of the human authors, but ultimately it came from the Holy Spirit. Notice 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 20, what he says there. That he says, here's what he says, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Paul said that the Scriptures were profitable to teach, to convict, to correct, and to make us complete, equipped for every good work, 2 Peter, 2 Timothy 3, and in verse 16. The scripture provides instruction for the church. Notice 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, Paul said, If I delay, you may know how you ought to obey. He said, Behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Then we find it talks about how we are to live within a family. Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 22, he tells in the family structure, wives submit to your own husbands. Husbands are to be head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. The church is submit to Christ as the wives are to submit and everything to their husband. Husbands are to love their wives, he says in verse 25. And then you get down into Chapter 6, we find children are, are to obey the parents in the Lord. You're to honor your fathers and mothers. It's a first commandment with promise that it may go well with you, he says in verse 3. And then finally, the family structure, he said, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger or to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It tells us about personal day-to-day -day living regarding speech, actions, and even emotions. Notice, if you will, Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 25, Therefore, having put away falsehoods, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Look at the conduct here. He said, but only such things as good for building up as fit the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, there's emotion, clamor, slander, there's some more emotion, be put away from you along with all malice. There's the real bad emotion right there. Be kind to one another. Here's the emotion we're to have tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. It also talks about conflict resolution. There's companies that make millions, perhaps dollars, on seminars talking about dealing with conflict resolution. The Bible will tell you that without you even having to spend a dime except to get the Bible. Notice, if you will, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, and when you get there, drop down to verse 21. He said, you have heard it said of old, to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angered with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel, and whoever says you fool will be liable to hell fire. 
So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Much more. There are so many things we can learn from the teaching in the Bible and from the example of the saints recorded in the Bible. Paul explains that if we want peace from God to overcome the anxieties, stresses of life, we need to follow what we learn from them. That means we do not follow our feelings. We do not follow the crowd. We do not follow our peer group. Our, our family, we follow God according to his word. Then we will have peace because only then can we rest assured that we have done what is right. Certainly, I'm not so naive as to think that you can go home after this lesson or after you finish this lesson if you're at home still, go through these three-step process and never have stress again. However, as you grow in Christ, spending your time doing these three things, trusting God in prayer, thinking good thoughts, and doing what you know is right, no matter what, the God of peace will be with you and through God's grace will overcome the stresses and anxieties of life. Be sure to get the note card that goes with this lesson. The link to it was found in the description and you can refer to it often, not because it's my words, but because it's words from the Bible. It's words from the greatest, one of the greatest apostles to ever live, the apostle Paul from the New Testament. Bob's your uncle. Cheer up. Now, what must I do to be saved? The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We know that we must believe Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Hebrews 11, 6, we learn without faith, it's impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Acts 17, 30 points out to us that we must repent. The time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all people everywhere to repent. And then by faith, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Be baptized scripturally, that is, immersed in water, Romans 6, 3 through 6, points that out. Colossians 2, 12 and 13 points that out. For the remission of sin, Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sin. We learn in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Creek. We could say today there's not black or white. There's not Latino. That we're all one in Christ. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Then we're to live by faith. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bob's your uncle. Cheerio, mate. Till next time. Now, thanks for watching this on YouTube from the Spring Hill Church of Christ, meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana, the zipper, 71075. Our email address is on the list somewhere. It's macmichael 
M-A-C-M-I-K-E-A-L at M-A-C dot com. Service times, 9.35 a.m. for Bible study, 10.45 in the a.m. Central Time for a worship service, 4 p.m. in the pre-evening, pre-evening. Evening starts at 6. This is pre-evening, so it's 4. Wednesday evening, 6.30 evening time, 6.30 p.m. Come join us in person or watch us again. And be sure to watch this video that we suggest to you. Subscribe and tell others. And if you'd like to help us on Patreon, we're at patreon.com under Mac Michael, M-A-C-M-I-K-E-A-L. Until next time, Bob's your uncle. Cheerio, mate.